Would you pray with me, please? Father God, we acknowledge today that you are our vision, that you are the ruler of all, that you are the God of the universe, and you have chosen to incredibly bless us. We thank you for your presence in our life and your presence here as we lift our voices in worship and praise to you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. We're in the second of a four-part series entitled, What Gives from Transaction to Transformation? Transaction to trans. Did you know that your transactions can actually become transformation? Please say yes. There's going to be a lot of audience response today. I want to start today with a quick story. There was a family that lived in New York City, in the heart of New York City. And one day they decided, we've had enough. We've had enough of the city life. We've had enough of the crowds and the noise and the overwhelming people and all the things that go on in the city, we're going to get away from it. We're going to go to the country. So they purchased a working cattle ranch, multiple acres and a working cattle ranch, and their friends thought they were nuts. What are you doing? You're leaving the city. You're leaving culture. You're leaving everything. You're going to a working cattle ranch? Yes, we need to get away. They packed up. They moved. They left. About four months later, a friend of theirs decided he was going to go see and make sure that they hadn't lost their mind. He comes driving up this working cattle ranch. He turns on to the dirt road. And you know how on a ranch they have this sign, this metal arch that's over it that's the name of the ranch? Well, as he pulled in, he noticed that there was no name on the ranch. So he pulls in, he drives up to the front, screeches to a halt at the front in this dirt drive and there's this beautiful rambling ranch house with a gorgeous front porch. His friend comes running out and says, why are you here? He said, I had to make sure you hadn't lost your mind. This is a beautiful piece of property, but I have a question. There's no name on your arch. What's the name of the ranch? He said, well, you know, we had a really hard time choosing the name of our ranch. I wanted to call it the Flying W. This beauty, um, open your wings, get an escape, go have a great time on this working cattle ranch. My wife wanted to call it the Suzy Q. So cute, the Suzy Q Ranch. I couldn't handle the Suzy Q Ranch. My son wanted to call it the Bar J, a really strong name. My other son wanted to call it the Rock and Y. Kind of kick back on the front porch in your rocking chair. And his friend said, well, what did you choose? He said, well, we couldn't choose any of them, so we chose all of them. So the name of the ranch is the Flying W, Susie Q, Bar J, Rock and Y Ranch. He said, man, that is a mouthful. He said, well, when you can't choose, that's the consequence. He said, but tell me something. This is a working cattle ranch, right? He said, yes, it is. He said, well, I don't see any cattle. His friend said, well, none of them survived the branding. Choices have consequences. We make choices every single day. Choices every single day. The choices that you make on what you're going to eat, what you're going to dress, what you're going to do for the day. The choices that you make have consequences, and especially as we deal with the stewarding of the resources we've been blessed with. Our choices have consequences. Do we choose the temporal, do we choose the eternal? Do we choose for my kingdom? Do I choose for God's? What do I choose with the resources that I've been blessed with? And do my choices have the consequences that I'm willing to participate in, I'm willing to be part of? What is the basis for your choice? I'm going to challenge us today out of this passage of Scripture. It's one of the two seminal passages on giving. And yes, it's a sermon on giving. Can we say yay? Yay. Oh, really? Okay, well, we're going to talk about six hours then. (laughs) 
<laughs> Yay. We're going to deal with what I think are the three fundamental basic issues of the heart for how we steward our resources. Turn with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, in your pew Bible, it's on page 968. So in your Bible there, 968, we're only going to be in this passage. This is where we're going to park ourselves for the next several hours. Let me start with the first principle here, coming in verses 6 and 7. The point is this. Don't you love the fact that Paul gets right to it? The point is this. In this letter to this, the second letter to the church at Corinth, he says, here's the point. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. In this second letter, Paul is setting up the reason why the church should have the heart of God. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. It makes sense, doesn't it? If you don't put enough seed in the ground, you're not getting enough of a crop. If you don't sow bountifully, if you don't sow a lot of seed, you're not going to reap a tremendous harvest. It's this principle. God blesses people in proportion to their blessing others. If you sow, if you bless others, God will bless you. Now make sure we understand we're not talking prosperity gospel here. I am not talking he may bless you in kind, but I am talking if you bless others, he will bless. It's one of the main principles why he wants us to be blessing others so he can bless us. The example of the farmer here, and notice a couple of things that are really important. First of all, the farmer has the freedom to sow a little or sow a lot, right? The farmer has the freedom to sow a little or sow a lot. It's his choice on how much he sows. God doesn't say exactly how much you should sow. He gives you the freedom to be able to make that choice. Second, if you sow a lot, you will reap a lot. Third, this is the really important part. This is not an issue of quantity. It's an issue of quality. Where is your heart? Does my heart desire to reap? Then I'll sow a lot. Does my heart desire not to reap? Then I'll sow a little. Plant a little, plant a lot. Father Travis talked last week about the fact that it's all God's anyway. But where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Where is your heart related to sowing a little or sowing a lot? And then this passage, God loves a cheerful giver. You see, what God wants you to give from is the right motive. He doesn't want you to give under compulsion. He doesn't want you to give under guilt. He doesn't want you to give thoughtlessly. He doesn't want you to give without really thinking it through. In fact, the little word cheerful in the Greek is the word we get hilarious from. What God wants you to do is be a hilarious giver. A cheerful, a joyful, a giver that is overflowing. Be a hilarious giver of your time, your talents, your gifts, your resources. Be a hilarious giver. Isn't that an incredible thought? That we could give so much we could be laughing ourselves silly. Be a hilarious giver. And what makes us a cheerful giver? What makes us a hilarious giver? This simple fact that we recognize how much God has given to us. We recognize that God is an incredibly gracious and an incredibly generous God. I want to read a couple of passages to you to show you just how generous your God is. Ephesians 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual, not just a few, but every spiritual blessing, in the heavenly places, Ephesians 1, 7 through 8. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in wisdom and insight. 
1 Timothy 6. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor set their hopes on uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Do you see the beginning of a pattern here? God is an incredibly generous God who gives us everything. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Philippians 4.19, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Jesus Christ. We have an incredibly generous God. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Lewis Ferry Chafer, the founder of Dallas Theological Seminary, back in 1929, wrote an eight-volume tome on systematic theology. It's not light reading. Required, but it wasn't light reading. And in that, he claimed this, that God, the moment we trust Christ, God gives us 33 divine gifts of grace. 33 divine gifts of grace. We get them instantaneously, we get them simultaneously, we get them eternally, and they're on the basis of the work of Jesus Christ in our life, not on anything we've done. He also says in Romans eleven twenty nine, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, meaning once God gives you those gifts, guess what? He doesn't take them back. 33 divine gifts of grace. Let me read a couple of them to you. You're in the eternal plan of God. You're redeemed. You're reconciled. You're related to God. You're forgiven of all trespasses. You're free from the law. You're children of God. You're adopted. You're acceptable to God. You're delivered from the power of darkness. You're in the kingdom. You're on the rock. You're partakers of the royal priesthood. You're heavenly citizens. You're in the family of God. You're partners with Christ. You have access to God. You have a saintly inheritance. You're the light in the Lord. You're blessed with the Holy Spirit. You're glorified. You're complete in him, and you have every spiritual blessing. You ought to be standing on top of your pews and dancing right now. Our God is an incredibly generous God. In fact, say that with me. My God is a generous God. My God is a generous God. Now say it like you believe it. My God is a generous God. Amen? First principle. My God is a generous God. And he proves his generosity to you over and over again, and especially in the fact that God so loved the world that he gave his only son for you. Look at verses 8 and 9 and the second principle here. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he is distributed freely. He's given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Did you hear those words? All and all and all and all. The second thing we see here is that not only God is a generous God, but God is a gracious God. He lavishes grace. You know what grace is? Grace is getting what I don't deserve. Mercy is withholding what I do deserve. Grace is getting what I don't deserve. Justice is getting exactly what I deserve. But this is why Paul covers the basis when he says mercy and grace and mercy and grace. Unmerited favor, getting what I don't deserve. I can't buy it, I can't earn it, I can't pay for it, but God lavishes that grace upon me. He's able to make all grace abound to you. God is able and willing to grace you. And the one he graces the most, the hilarious giver. One of the principles that God tells us is, The more I give, the more he graces. God loves to grace a hilarious giver. Having all sufficiency in all things at all times, he provides everything that we need. When we say the Lord's Prayer, and we'll say it at the end here, 
Notice that it doesn't say, give us this day my 401k. What he does say is, be dependent upon me because my sufficiency will provide for your need. Not for your greed, but for your need. When my wife Melissa and I got married, right before we got married, I had decided to go into business, and I told my dad, who I went into business with, that I first of all really thought I was going to go into the ministry, and he said, don't go in the ministry. They don't make money in the ministry. And he was right. But the one thing he didn't know, he was a believer, but moving toward this point that God supplies the need. So after 20 years in business, I decided, and God called me to come into ministry. And in order for me to get into ministry, the pastor that I went to, the church I went to minister, and he said, in order for me to be able to pay your salary, I need you to think of the least amount of money you can live on and cut it in half. There's a sales pitch, isn't there? The least amount of money you can live on, cut it in half, and you need to raise the other half for two years. Now, let me just tell you, friends, money is the one place that I have grown in my faith more than any other because I moved into that ministry, and in two months, God had raised up two years of the other half. He's done that time and time and time again for us. My wife loves to call it God math. We get to the end of the year, and we look at our finances, and we go, there is no physical way that we should be in the black right now. And there's only one way to explain it. God math. God's math is not the world's math. And what we have found over and over and over again, personal testimony is when we are hilarious givers, God supplies the need, not the greed, but the need. We're to abound in every good work. Notice here that what he says is the reason why all my sufficiency is there and why I supply your need is this. That, so what will abound in you, with my grace abounding in you, you will abound in every good work. So that how you steward your gifts and your resources and your talents and your finances will result in good work. You know, Paul says in Philippians 4, you need to learn to be content whether you have a lot or you have a little. And that contentment comes in one secret, in Christ. You can be content. I want to tell you a little secret here. Um, I did not know the gospel passage for today. The loaves and fishes. In my notes, I'm going to talk to you about the loaves and fishes because that's what the Lord told me to talk about is the, Lord's and the, the loaves and fishes here. But I didn't know it was the gospel reading until just five minutes ago when you heard it. So let's talk about loaves and fishes real quick. The feeding of the 5,000. Jesus goes out. This is in John 6. It's also in Matthew 14. Jesus goes out, and he's teaching on, on the hillside. And there's 5,000 people there, and the disciples come to him, and they say, you know, they're going to be hungry. We need to feed them. And Jesus says, okay, go ahead and feed them. You want us to feed? Yes, you go ahead and feed them. Well, we don't have enough money. Okay, what do we have? What's available to us right now? And this little boy walks up, and he has five barley loaves and two small fish. Now, the one person that we have a tendency to overlook in the story of the feeding of the 5,000 is that little boy. Because here's what he does. He gives his gift hilariously, overwhelmingly, joyfully, he gives his gift to the Lord. And what does the Lord do with it? He increases it a hundredfold. He feeds everyone. Did the boy get fed? Met his need. Twelve baskets of leftovers brought back. What do you think that little boy felt? Look at what God did with what I did. When we give hilariously, we're like that little boy. We give 
And God takes it because it's in the right heart, in the right motive, from the right place, because we understand how generous God is with us and how gracious God is with us. And we turn around and we give it, and God says, watch what I will do with a gift from the right heart and the right motive. Our God is a gracious God. Say that one with me. My God is a gracious God. Again, like you mean it, my God is a gracious God. So he's not only generous, he's gracious. Showers us beyond our wildest imaginings with the things that we can't earn and we can't buy and we can't do anything for. Generous and gracious. But in this last section, 10 through 14, we're going to find that he is also a glorious God. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed and sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Now notice what he says there. Who supplies the seed? God. Really good. But you can say it with a little bit of enthusiasm. Who supplies the seed? And we sow. He supplies the seed, but then look at what he also does. The sowing, and then the increase of the harvest for your righteousness. What gets increased in me? My righteousness. I become more Christ-like. That thing that God is trying to build in me gets built in me. The holiness that I am imputed from Christ, the righteousness that gets brought to me in Christ, the fact that I become more Christ-like gets built in me when I am generous in my giving of my time and my talents and my resources and my finances. I become more Christ-like from transactional to transformation. I get transformed into the image of Christ. Did you realize that's a byproduct of me actually being a hilarious giver? I become more like Jesus. And it happens this way. You'll be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. So you'll be enriched in every way. You'll be generous in every way. It'll produce thanksgiving. But here's the point. The approval of this service, they will then glorify God because of your submission that comes from the confession of the gospel of Christ. Because of who you are, and because of this hilarious giving, the glory of God is put on display. Now let me explain the glory of God, and then we're going to wrap this whole thing up. The glory of God, glory is translated this way, the visible manifestation of the character of God. So when you glorify God, guess who's on display? Yes, but what's on display in God is his character. His character that has been, by the way, created in you. I was born in the image of God. I'm meant to carry out, to bear the image of God to the world. And one of the best ways to bear the image of God to the world is to glorify him, which is to put him on display, his character on display. We've just said he's a generous God and a gracious God. So guess what? I don't have to try to be generous or try to be gracious because it's already built into me. His glory, his character is already in me, so all I have to do is choose to be generous. Choose to be gracious. And the more I choose to be generous and the more I choose to be gracious, guess what happens? I begin to show off the character of Christ to the world. The character of Christ that was generous and gracious, gracious to me. When I put him on display, his character on display in us, we need to choose to show him off. To glorify him. To show him off to the world by my generosity and my graciousness to other people. I want you to hear real quick these, these words in here because they're really significant. He supplies, he multiplies, he enriches, and when he does this, he gets put on display. When he does this through me, he gets put on display. And here's the result. Thanksgiving, ministry, the needs of the saints go supplied, the gospel is being spread, and prayers happen. Doesn't that sound like a wonderful consequence of the choice to be generous and gracious? 
Paul in Philippians 1 says this, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now understand, we love to say that about us, but it's not. That's a passage related specifically to the church at Philippi. The good work of the church, the good work of the church in supporting ministry, that's the, that's the thing that Paul's talking about. And in fact, Philippians is a thank you letter from Paul to the church at Philippi for them supporting him. He has begun a good work in you, the good work of, oh, by the way, you know that that means we are the result of that. The good work of Hope Point, the continued good work of Hope Point that Paul was confident would continue until Christ returns. He hasn't returned yet. So the good work goes on. We continue to be generous and gracious givers. Here's the final response. Look down at verse 15. So thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. The inexpressible gift of God to you, the generous and gracious gift of God to you, the glorious gift of God to you is the gift of his son Jesus Christ who died on your behalf, went to the cross for you, and gives you all of those 33 divine gifts. The inexpressible gift. It's a gift to all believers. It's the gift of the heart of God. A generous, gracious heart that's looking for generous and gracious givers. Because when you do, he gets put on display. He gets glorified. Matthew 6, Jesus says, don't lay up for yourself treasures in earth, on earth, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. The things that are eternal are the things that matter. So let me leave you this morning with four questions. Will we choose to be generous people of God? Will we choose to be gracious people of God? Will we choose to be glorious people of God? What will you choose? Lord God, we thank you that you are a God of grace, you are a God of generosity, you are a God of glory, and you lavish that upon us. May we be a people who respond to to that generosity and that graciousness and that glory. May we be a people that respond and say thank you for your inexpressible gift to us. And may you be the one who's put on display because we recognize when you get the credit, we get the blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.